And I want to I want you to see the characteristics of a missionary. If you don't have this in your notes, you can take time to put it in your notes and we're going to have to go one point at a time. Mm -hmm. We've heard from Daryl this morning already that he had his salvation experience when he heard the grace message. That's it. You don't have to work for it. Okay. And that's point number one. Yep. Every missionary must be a, must be born again and have grace orientation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I one of the one of the things regarding that point, Brad, is I think Christianity, and again, generally speaking. I think one of the greatest mistakes uh, the Christian world has made is sending sending people out into the mission field who were not truly born again. Uh, they'd been members of a church since they were five years old, got under a youth pastor when they were 10 and just loved their youth ministry and all this sort of stuff, but they were involved in a church that either required some sort of work like water baptism or whatever attached to grace, uh, and and what happened is they thought they got saved. I went to a Billy Graham crusade when I was 16 years old as a, as a Lutheran, uh, Luther leaguer. We went to Minneapolis, Minnesota, went to the crusade, and as he made the altar call and so on, I was watching everybody get up and go, and I got up and went down there. I, well, I thought I'd saved, you know, but, boy, he's sure making me sound like I need to get down there. Emotion drew me down there, and when they gathered us all there at the front, they said, okay, now repeat after me. And they had to say the sinner's prayer, at the end of which we invited Jesus into our heart. And I thought, wait a minute. I didn't know then that that was a work attached to grace. And so I was 42 years old before I truly understood that I was dead. My old man was crucified with Christ on the cross. And it was no longer I who lived, but Christ lived in me. Amen. I want to go on to point number two because we've also mentioned this. Every missionary must have gone through preparation through intense doctrinal study. And we heard how, how Daryl had spent a lot of flying in on the weekends to study with Dr. Jim and uh, true motivation. That's it. You can't be motivated by the right thing. You don't have the truth. You can't be. You can't have the right motivation. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And it, it starts, and that's where it is. It's the motivation. And so much work is done by by Christians. Uh, their but their motivation is is um, I want to work to please God. If I do this well, God will be pleased. And that's the wrong motivation. It needs to be the truth of the Word of God leading you by the Spirit. And, of course, we've learned old man, new man, it must be functioning in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, the spiritual Christian versus the carnal. Excellent. We're studying that in Colossians right now. Yep. Point three, every missionary must be oriented to the three phases of God's plan for me. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. you know, the charismatic, they, they're stuck in phase one. Yep. That's all they can deal with. Right. Can't talk about anything else trying to stay saved. That's right. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Make your point. Yep. And uh, Daryl is straightening the, the pastors out on, on hey, once you're saved, you need to get on and start learning some spiritual life stuff and yep. get past this evangelizing every weekend. That's right. That's right. And start teaching. Yep. Yep. And that brings up point number four. Every missionary must understand divine guidance. Have we heard from you? He absolutely knew that's where he needed to be at. And, and he was led to, to leave America and go teach the Bible in the Philippines. I told somebody yesterday. They were asking me what, what they should do and so on and so forth about, about a certain circumstance. They weren't sure what to do and were, were trusting on the leading of the Spirit, whatever. And I told them this. I said, listen, I've learned one thing. If I'm faced with a circumstance and I'm not sure what to do, I do know what I should do, and that's study. <laughs> and that's exactly what I do. I I don't try to figure out what I should do. I know I need to study. So when I can't make a decision, I go to studying. And as I study, lo, we know. 
the spirit will reveal the direction in which he wants me to go. Amen. Every missionary must understand the doctrine of separation. Now, this is a trick point because what you see on the mission field is somebody goes into a foreign country and they just kind of fall into whatever opens up for them. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say you go to a church and you begin to teach and all of a sudden somebody starts flopping out on the floor and uh, rolling around and then you got somebody over here that starts speaking in tongues and um, Daryl, I know you, you're going to straighten them out right away. <laughs> but if the thing continues on, are you going to continue to teach there? Well, here's what I'm going to do. If I've been given the responsibility to teach, it's, if, it, if I'm in charge, if I'm in charge, I'm going to demand that they leave if they want to continue to practice that. I believe it. I believe, and, and I believe, as we read in, in uh, the situation with the young man in Corinth who was sleeping with his father's wife, Paul says, hey, get him out of there. Get him out of there and, and turn him over, turn him out to the world. We don't need that influence. And I believe in Second Timothy, Paul's very clear. If they continue to practice these things, do not fellowship with them. But I also believe, too, that if they respond, in a, they get out there, they come to their senses, we in love need to let, let them come back as well, which is, I think, we saw in that lesson in Second Corinthians. Very good. So that, that saves the missionary from a lot of trouble uh, from getting mixed up in the wrong group and yeah. accepting the wrong teaching and also having the wrong students. And this is this is why I'm pretty I'm still alone over there. I, I, you know, not alone. I, I'm alone in the ministry. I have Nita, of course, but no other men have ever. I tried it one year to have another man come in and teach while I was gone. It didn't work. And so I just I'm in charge, and if they want to come in and try their tongue speaking, there's the door. Yeah. Point six, we talked about North Dakota on this one. Mm -hmm. Every missionary must be able to acclimate to his field, uh, whether it be weather, customs, or language. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about the Philippines before you have two seasons, dust and dust, mud. Dust and mud. Dust and mud. <laughs> um, but it, I guess the Lord took me out in 1998. I've, I'd already committed to going there. And, and you know, but we had pretty much stayed in the city. But in 1996, I went out to three different areas, and I slept on the floor. You know, I took a, a bag along and a, a blanket. I took an air mattress with me in 1996, uh, and the first night I used it, the piece of wood I laid it down on had some slivers, so it ran out of air in about two hours. <laughs> and so I became accustomed to sleeping on wood, uh, and I could do it. I I could sleep at it. We went out to a place in the in the, in the mountain area, the Bukid they call it. No electricity, no running water, a dirt floor in the kitchen, in the dining area where we ate, so on. Um, and I thought, you know, I can live like this. I can live like this. We carried water in buckets to take it to the kitchen. And Nita was, I still had great food. Nita was my cook then too, before we were married. And, uh, you know, we, I said, you know, I can live like this. They cook on the fire. And I knew then that I was going to survive. And I, a lot of people, a lot of people can't. But if you're going to be on the mission field, you need to, you need to learn to adjust. And, my military career brought that to me. You know, there's people in my hometown that the farthest they've ever been is 100, 300 miles over to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I mean, that's as far as they've gone from North Dakota, maybe. Um, and so the, the Lord took me to Vietnam, to Turkey, to Germany, to France, to Norway, um, to, get, to, to get acclimated to languages, acclimated to weather, all that sort of stuff. And so I've, I've learned, to, learned to adjust. And the Lord prepared me that way. Amazing. That's it. Amazing. He prepared me. I had no idea. I had what no idea what He was doing. But He prepared me for it. Point seven: Every missionary must be able to train men to fish. That means get out with a pole, right? <laughs> I've you know, got a verse this is, 
this is this is the thing. And here, you know, we're speaking about the fishers of men. And I have no I have no problem. Yes, we must we must be willing to to speak about the Lord and his work to save the unbeliever. Uh, my problem is this. Through this idea of evangelizing, we have sent unqualified people into that mission field. And I think we're going to be surprised at the number of so-called thousands and tens of thousands of reports that they didn't get saved because they they were adding work of some form, whatever it might be. They didn't get saved because they heard an emotional evangelistic message. They didn't hear the true unemotional facts. And I've, I've set down for my pastor eight facts that you need to share. And I won't go into all that here, but I told them if that unbeliever does not understand these eight things and doesn't take a spiritual mind to understand them. They're simply facts and they need to reason upon those facts. And when they do, they can, they can trust. And my problem has been, we need to function as ambassadors. And the key is the evangelistic message and the message of the ambassador is the same. The difference is the ambassador is one who's been trained, <laughs> the one who has the qualifications to go out with the message. We've sent too many evangelists out unqualified. I want to make one point under this, be able to train men to fish. This also is the idea of multiplication. Multiplication. Right. Because on a normal mission trip, you go in and you, you uh, evangelize or you talk or you teach, and then you go home. Daryl is teaching pastors from all over the Philippines, and his message is going from that one classroom, not just in individuals. These are pastors, and they're going back, and they're teaching mm -hmm. their congregations. And his, his methods are multiplication mm -hmm. through these pastors that he is training. Oh, and and the message is, is okay. out there. It's getting into the backwoods, into the mountains. And the next time, the next time, and I, oh man, I got many stories of different men. But the next time you go on my website, you go down down the legend on the left side to PNG, Papua New Guinea, and you click on that. There are some photographs. the The pastor who's in Papua New Guinea is Alex Io. He came to me from a Southern Baptist church in in General Santos City in. September of 2000 and studied with us for three months, September, October, November of the year 2000. And uh, you look at the pictures, a few years later, God grabbed him, he had prepared him, he left the pastorate, went to be in a, a hospital in Mindanao as the chaplain in that hospital. A man on the board owned a, one of the, he was one of the largest fishing magnet in, in the Philippines, and he owned a, a processing, a tuna processing plant in Papua New Guinea, Madang, Papua New Guinea, where he had about 3,000 employees, and he hired Alex to go to Madang and be the teacher, the chaplain in that place. And he's, this fishing magnet, we have another young man I trained who's a chaplain on one of those ships. And when those ships come in to unload their tuna, the chaplains come off, Alex, I could go on and on. <laughs> you go on that website and pull up those pictures one time. I, I shared the story of the young man who went on the, the ship, and I can't remember his name right now. Crowdy Kalula. Kalula. Yeah. Kalula. Yeah. Kalula. And uh, is, we, we is, shared, a, he had a picture of a moped loaded up with all his boxes going to work yep, on yep, the ship. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to run out of time if we don't move on. Yep, let's do it. Point A, every missionary must know his spiritual gift and its application. Um, in, in the passage in 1 Corinthians, we know that God the Holy Spirit supplies the gift. Mm -hmm. um, God the Father supplies the results from the gift. 
and Jesus Christ places in ministry. Correct. Absolutely. And Daryl has told us before that his spiritual gift is teacher, mm-hmm. and he is fulfilling his spiritual gift in the Philippines. Yeah. In Absolutely. the classroom, and so yeah. that's that's great. Point nine is for you, and uh, every missionary must. You'll notice that through every point, every missionary must be supported by a stable local church, prayer support, and financial support. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, Grace Bible Church, we're into missions. That's the reason we don't have a fancy building. That's the reason we don't spend a lot of money. Because what we collect, we want to get to missions, and we want to help in the mission mission field. And Daryl is out there working. He is out there on his own, and he is teaching sound doctrine to pastors. And I want you to consider him. We have the mission box in the back. We're going to uh, send that with, with Daryl when uh, he leaves today. And I want to, um, even if you don't give, I want you to pray for Daryl and right. Anita. And yep. they go back and pray for those pastors who are in this classroom, that they truly grab that, that truth and are able to go back and communicate. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things, and if we've got a minute or so, one of the problems I've discovered in the Philippines, and it's probably true throughout the mission field everywhere, is most, most missionaries go to the mission field under the authority of a mission board, some denominational mission board, whether it's the Baptist or Lutheran, whatever the case might be. And all the churches in that denomination, of course, they give this much to missions, and it goes into that mission board fund, and they distribute to the various missionaries that they've, that they've sent out. And people can't believe that I'm over there and I don't have a mission board. Well, where do you get your support? Uh, my mom told me that one time when I was going. She said, well, well, how much money is the church in Little Rock sending you? I said, nothing. What? Well, you know, as people give, I receive. But there's no set rate. There's no set value. If someone is given, they send. If not, and honestly, uh, Dr. Jim's ministry has been very, very gracious to us. So I, you know, I don't want to discount that. But I respond: the Lord's in the business. It's His ministry, and I have learned that the Lord always provides in advance. I don't have to go in debt. I don't have to go begging. Someone says, "Well, how is He going to do it?" That's His business, not my business. And so, any of you, when as you hear as you hear this kind of message to support. You don't you be guilted out for any reason, and and you just the one thing you can do, pray. And if you're willing, if you are willing to be used of the Lord to be the instrument, I guarantee you, the Lord will have already put the money in your pocket. You won't have to sit and try to consider. Well, should I? Shouldn't I? I've got twenty dollars. I wish I had forty so I could give twenty. No, don't need any of that stuff. All right, I've learned that. If, if the Lord wants me to do it, he'll provide in advance. And if I, I don't have it in advance, guess what? I don't do it. No doubt. Yeah. I don't do it. And I think I, I trust the Lord in the giving side of all of that also, Brad. Yes, I right. really do. So the last question I have for you today, Daryl, quick question. Yeah. I hope you don't say no. My church and my friends have made it possible for me to go on a mission trip. Really? Yes, sir. And I just got my passport the other day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we already have a guest room. I picked, We had a guest <laughs> from England in the guest room, and we picked it. He left. So the guest room's ready for you. <laughs> that was my question. Can I come visit? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. Now, we really thank you and, and Nita for coming out today. I do want to mention who's online with us, and then we'll close in the Lord of Prayer. Yeah. Bill Buchanan from Texas, Brenda Allen from Clinton, Missouri. And let's have Nita, come on and walk over here for just a minute and step back in here so those those online can, can see my beautiful wife. And that's right. Yeah, come on around here, babe. <clears throat> Brenda Livingston from Hot Springs, Arkansas. <laughs> there she is. 
There's beautiful Nita. Thank you, Miss Nita, for coming. Dub and Joyce Blackwood are on with us from Little Rock, Arkansas. James Dixon from Arkadelphia. Linda Davis from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Sally Dixon from Social Hill, Arkansas. Uh, Terry, thank you for logging on. And also, y'all in and heard all you call it. Oh, yelling. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Awesome. I thank all of you for logging on and I hope to see you Wednesday night or Sunday morning. All right. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. All right. That's good. Mm-hmm. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for Daryl and Nita Anderson and we thank you that, um, Father, you sent them to the right place with the right work and with the right message. Father, today as we go forward, we're just praying for their ministry and uh, also the ones that support it. And thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Love you guys. Love you too. Thank you, Brad. Okay. Let me do one more. Yeah. Ready? One, two, three. There we go. All right. All right. Excellent, sir. Great to have you. Great to see you. Yep. Thanks, y'all. Hope to see you Wednesday night. No, I'm fine.